Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Community Health Impact Coalition, SHIC Research Roundup at 100 celebrations. It's a day for celebrations, so get ready to clap your hands and show that you're happy for this. We are so glad you are here. A quick note on translation before we begin. We have live interpretation between English and French for the event, which you can access through the interpretation button on the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you are having trouble with translation, please drop a note in the chat and a member of SHIC will support you. My name is Pauline Picho Kerenyai, and I am the Executive Director of Nama Wellness Community Center. I'll be serving as your moderator through the session. Nama Wellness Community Center was founded in 2014 in May, and we are headquartered in Nukojo Village, Nama Sub-County, Mukono District, Uganda. We work in the rural parts of Uganda with our community experiencing poor health outcomes, evidenced by increased maternal, neonatal, infant and child mortality and morbidity. And this is attributed to weak community health systems and lack of access to quality healthcare services at the community level. That is why we advocate for the formalization and professionalization of CHWs who are linked to government health facilities that will result in the delivery of quality integrated community health services that are affordable, culturally appropriate, evidence-based, and accessible to every household in Mukono district. And we are a member of SHIC. SHIC is making professional community health workers the norm worldwide by changing guidelines, funding, and policy. We'll learn more about SHIC from our first speaker, the amazing Dr. Madeline Ballard, who is doing a great job at the SHIC Secretary together with her assistant, Carrie, and all the members at the Secretary, including the Board of Directors. In 100 editions of the Research Roundup, read by thousands of practitioners around the world, she has identified and synthesized key findings, commentary, and implications for hundreds of the latest academic research on community health. Any community health workers, please clap your hands. Today, we are bringing you highlights from the top three papers identified by coalition members like myself as being particularly relevant for the current state of the evidence on community health workers. Again, any CHWs around, please clap your hands. We'll hear from Dr. Megan Bruce Kumar, Dr. Almami Malik Kante, and Afra Niwasima on their research. I am also proud to welcome to you Joseph Adoyo, the Deputy County Medical Laboratory Coordinator at the Department of Health, Puma Bay County Government in Kenya, just in my neighborhood and John Wawire Shukuku, a CHW advocate, to discuss how they use research and the research roundup in their work. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you live today. I repeat, you hope, we hope you live today with a reaffirmed commitment for evidence-based CHW decision-making. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to our amazing Dr. Madeline Ballard to kick us off with a scene setting on why we are here today. Dr. The microphone is yours and the floor is yours. Please take it over from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pauline. Um, what a uh, privilege to have an amazing hype woman like you in my corner. <laughs> Thank you very much for welcoming us all and setting the scene uh, for today's event. Um, as Pauline shared, I want to kick us off by uh, just sharing some important context for today's event uh, and adding to what, what Pauline shared. Um, we're in a world at present where millions of community health workers, 70% uh, of whom are women, by the way. I know we have John with us today, but he's, he's not a representative sample, as we say in the research world, um, though he's a very important uh, advocate, and you'll hear more about uh, his experience uh, in a little bit, a little bit later on in the program, um, but millions of community health workers are not paid, not supported, not supplied, 
And uh, what we see is a dual sided human rights issue. So we have CHWs who are exploited on the one hand uh, from a labor perspective and less effective for patients. And so as a consequence, 1 billion people who are alive today will actually go their entire lives without seeing a health worker. And as Pauline shared, Community Health Impact Coalition is a team of community health workers and global health organizations in about 40 countries. And together, we are making professional community health workers uh, a norm worldwide. And we do that by changing guidelines, funding, and policy. So uh, what exactly do you mean by professional CHWs, by pro CHWs? That's what's up on the screen now. Uh, we, we synthesize it into CHWs who are salaried, skilled, supervised, and supplied. So the four S's, obviously um, it's a little bit more complicated than, than just that. But again, in a world where uh, two thirds of CHWs on the African continent are unsalaried, where CHWs are out of stock one third of the time, we wanna start here. We need to treat CHWs like professionals so that they can perform like them. And uh, we at Chic are very much um, uh, united around the idea and the, the truth that community health workers work. Uh, it's a double entendre, it's in the name. Uh, they work, they lower um, the amount of deaths in communities, the amount of sickness, um, but they do that by really working their tails off. And so our shared vision is that we achieve quality of care for all, including those who provide it. So what does this actually look like in practice? Um, to make pro CHWs the norm worldwide, uh, the coalition uses three interconnected tactics, uh, advocacy, uh, in-country CHW network activation, and research. So we advocate together to influence global financing institutions, we activate in-country CHW networks, um, of which John's a leader of, uh, to win pro CHW national policy. But the backbone for both of these activities is really uh, the research that we do together to equip international norm setters uh, with the evidence that they require to create pro CHW uh, guidelines. We firmly believe that research is a tool to dismantle immodest claims of causality, to expand ideas of what's possible in community health and to overcome institutional obstacles. I'm sure many people on this call have heard it said, oh, community health workers can't do this, or uh, it's too expensive to do that. And I think um, what research allows us to do is treat those, converse, those questions as the beginning to a conversation, not the end of a conversation. Are you sure community health workers can't do that? Why don't we test it? Um, it's too expensive? Well, what does it cost? Uh, these are the types of questions that we're answering together. Uh, we try to focus on questions that really no one organization, as amazing as they are, as amazing as NAMA Wellness is, uh, as, as Pauline is as a leader, uh, so many of these questions are bigger than any one county or district or country. They're questions that concern us uh, globally. And so we need to come together across countries to answer them. And by publishing in the peer-reviewed literature, we can more effectively influence normative guidelines on CHW programs. Because I think as we all know, uh, there's so much great knowledge out there about community health workers and community health programs and how to uh, effectively run them for impact. And that knowledge is sitting uh, in a PDF uh, in someone's uh, documents folder or in a file drawer um, and not able to easily be accessed by folks around the world and certainly not um, accessible uh, to norm setters like Africa CDC or the WHO when they go to make their recommendations. So we need to make sure that this knowledge from practitioners across the world, from CHWs and aligned health organizations is indexed, indexed in the academic uh, research and the academic literature. And that's what some of the featured speakers on the calls today have really done so well and uh, what we're here to, to celebrate. So as part of our research work, uh, Community Health Impact Coalition curates and publishes a regular email newsletter on newly released CHW papers. Most of you here today are probably subscribers to this uh, email. It's called the Community Health Research Roundup. We're very excited about evidence-based practice, as you can see um, by the graphic on the screen. 
And uh, this roundup synthesizes findings and key takeaways from the latest academic studies on community health. Uh, it's available in English and French, and there are thousands of subscribers to this roundup. And we do it because it's key to our goal of increasing evidence use within the field. You'll see some of our papers on there, but of course, the vast majority of papers were not created by us. They're created by wonderful researchers from around the world um, teaming up uh, with community health workers and communities to, again, uh, generate critical knowledge for how to deliver better, higher quality services to more people. We're gathered here today, though, because uh, next week's issue of the Research Roundup will be our 100th. And so we want to celebrate this milestone by featuring the top 10 papers from across 100 issues of the Roundup. At this point, I think we've uh, profiled, gosh, somewhere between 700 and 800 papers. And we have chosen the top 10 takeaways that you need to know um, as a CHW, as a policymaker, or as a researcher uh, in this space. And to get the top 10, you'll actually need to subscribe because today we're only doing the top three. Um, but luckily for you, you can subscribe, uh, again, using the links on the screen, which will also uh, paste in the chat. So if you're uh, here and you're not yet a subscriber to the Research Roundup, um, you can take five minutes and do that now. But today, we are excited to offer you, as I said, a sneak peek of the top three papers, which are pictured on the screen. We have lead authors from each of them here with us uh, on the panel. And um, I wanna say that together these papers, along with the top seven papers we'll highlight in the forthcoming 100th issue, really begin to form a clear picture that professional CHW policy is both possible and necessary. So um, our first speaker, Dr. Megan Bruce Kumar, joins us to discuss her qualitative paper, How Do Decision Makers Use Evidence in Community Health Policy and Financing Decisions? Isn't this a question that everybody in this call has asked? She has actually studied it. And spoiler alert, uh, there is ample room to improve and increase evidence use in community health programming and financing decisions. And that alone, I think, is great news. And she'll tell us uh, how to do that. Next, uh, we're honored to be joined by Dr. Almamik Malik Kanté to outline his randomized trial, The Impact of Paid Community Health Worker Deployment on Child Survival. And this paper uh, is exceptional. It's been essential in solidifying the link between community health workers and childhood mortality decline. But again, only if CHWs are salaried and supplied. So there's a key link here between the conditions under which we can achieve impact and what's required. Uh, and uh, again, spoiler alert, pro CHWs are required. Finally, uh, we'll be joined by our very own Sheik member, Afra Nuasima, the Monitoring Evaluation and Learning Manager at Living Goods, uh, to outline our joint findings um, from our multi-country interrupted time series analysis, the continuity of community-based healthcare provision during COVID-19 why are community health workers so essential to pandemic preparedness and response? Afra is going to tell you. So these uh, and the seven of the papers that we'll highlight again in our forthcoming 100th issue next week uh, are really a go-to toolkit. Uh, I'd say the bare essentials, uh, the bare essential pieces of evidence that, again, you should know whether you're a CHW, a policymaker, a grant maker, uh, or someone who just wants to stand in solidarity with frontline workers. Um, there's a lot uh, to learn, but also we already know quite a lot. And that's what we want to emphasize in today's session. Uh, and that's why we're going to conclude our time together by hearing from uh, Joseph Adoyo, again, of the Homa Bay County government in Kenya, uh, and John Rabir Sukuvu, who's a leading CW advocate on why evidence uh, use is important to them in their role in government, uh, in their role as a care provider and an organizer. Uh, and how they use the research roundup for this purpose. So get ready to be uh, inspired and, and also hear some new ideas for how you might begin to apply evidence uh, in your own work and how that could potentially strengthen uh, your aims and your goals. But uh, enough from me, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Megan Bruce Kumar to take us through paper number one. Thanks, Megan. 
Thanks. Good evening and good morning um, and good everything else. Uh, my name is Megan Kumar. I'm based in Nairobi for the last 10 years, uh, working both with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and with Kemri Wellcome Trust. And as Madeline said, I'm going to be presenting on how decision makers use evidence in community health policy and financing. Um, I'm a health economist, but we don't only do numbers. We also do uh, qualitative work, and it's really essential um, in understanding what evidence we should be producing, what evidence is most useful, and maybe where there are opportunities to align better the evidence needs um, and the evidence generation. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of several co-authors uh, who are maybe in the audience tonight, um, and I appreciate all of their contributions to this work as well. Next slide, please. So um, I will primarily read from the slides. I think that will help uh, with those of you who are joining from uh, a different language background. So I apologize if, uh, if you find it a little repetitive. Um, my paper looks at, um, in the context of thinking about investments that countries could make to help deliver on universal health coverage, um, community health appears often in countries' plans. And when people discuss it, they say, okay, this is how we get access. This is how we solve the problem of reaching the unreached and the last mile. Yet despite a lot of discussion on resource mobilization um, to support this, little is known about the costs and the value of investing in this area, um, as well as how evidence on costs and investment would be used by relevant decision makers. Um, so we conducted this study to understand the use of evidence in policy and financing decisions for countries with large scale community health programs. Um, and we focused on four countries in our work. Next slide. We, so the four countries we looked at were Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, and Mozambique. And each of those countries was also part of the, the reach out program, which was um, had done a lot of context analysis work and then had designed a quality improvement intervention, both around supportive supervision um, and around further QI capacity at the community level. So we used a cross-sectional approach um, and we focused on decision makers at the global and national level, though um, with the acknowledgement that a lot of other decision makers and um, implementers are involved in actually making the evidence turn into practice. So this was really about the use of evidence at the policy level. Um, and we looked at people involved in financing decisions in policy decisions around um, appropriate practice with researchers working on community health systems and with implementers and health workers in each country um, to try to look at the process of financing prior and priority decision, um, priority setting decisions, uh, the stakeholders involved and the wider decision space. Next slide. So what did we find? As Madeline said, there is room for improvement. Um, so the use of economic evidence particularly, and again, this doesn't speak to um, the wider research evidence that many of you are generating and using, um, is relatively limited. Why is that? It's partly because of the perceived poor quality um, of the evidence. So people find evidence from another setting may not be relevant to them, rightly so. Um, so we need to think more about transferability of evidence. And the second is the capacity of decision makers to use it. Many people are a little bit uh, allergic to numbers. Now, oh, I'm not an accountant. I can't deal with, you know, cost information. Um, there, there's a fear among people at multiple levels of what does a cost effectiveness ratio mean? And what if I'm already funding something and it doesn't look cost effective? What do I do then? Um, secondly, the, the economic evidence rightly or wrongly, is perceived as being of limited relevance to deci domestic decision-making. So when we spoke to people at the national level across almost all of the countries, um, generally they said, yeah, we know that it's out there. Maybe we have a department that handles it. Perhaps it's part of our procedures for priority setting. This varied from country to country. But even in that case, um, 
it doesn't get used. It's more about effectiveness. Uh, we're really looking at those impact pieces and not so much about the cost pieces. Um, and some of that is because of the predominance of external financing um, in supporting these programs. So global level, um, the decision makers and funders we spoke to were quite interested and already actively using um, these data. But at the national level, this was much less prevalent. Um, thirdly, and this again may have changed a bit since uh, the, the work was done in 2017, 2018, um, decision makers really were emphasizing community health workers as a means of increasing access to services. Um, so it was about reaching those who were beyond the close proximity to the health centers or people who might not directly go and access services, you know, um, immunization defaulters, rather than um, thinking about the quality of care. So quality was underfunded um, and, and rarely mentioned as a priority at either the global or the national level. Um, and lastly, we found that stopping established approaches to community health, um, whatever they might be, often um, cobbled together from investment by different donors in different portions of the country um, to make some kind of a patchwork quilt um, in favor of a different, perhaps more economically viable or, or sustainable approach was seen as politically challenging because people are tied into a system that exists now, inevitably um, there are vested interests in maintaining that system. And so disinvestment was seen as really tricky. And therefore, even if you produce economic evidence that's compelling that says, we need to invest in this area, it's difficult to move away from what's currently being invested in. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, just to think about then what this means, evidence use is constrained. Um, and I apologize, this figure is a little small, but it's bigger bigger in the paper if you want to read the full thing. Um, it's constrained and influenced by contextual factors that are not related to, to the relevance and the quality of the evidence. So in our um, framework, we look at the micro level as the ideal evidence-based policy setting, something like a quality improvement cycle, where you select a priority, priority area, assess the evidence, source funds to intervene uh, based on what the evidence shows, and then you evaluate how that investment worked. Um, in reality, at the MISO level, because of local or national constraints, um, and these include lack of data, um, informalization of priority setting procedures um, and limited capacity to use evidence, that ideal cycle isn't met. And then from the global level at the macro um, level, we see financing um, structures not meeting the needs, um, external financing driving priority setting and despite a misalignment with national priorities um, and limited resources available for evaluation of whether those investments were good ones or not. Um, and decision makers generally showed a willingness and interest to focus on um, further evaluation, um, but have limited resources in their own domain to, to commission or undertake evaluations and no pressure from a, a, their own prior performance success um, performance evaluations to use the results. Last slide, please. So finally, um, we see an opportunity to build demand uh, for evidence and capacity to use it. And this is a cycle that will have a positive feedback loop. Um, and it, it needs efforts both by economists um, as well as by us working with decision makers themselves. Um, we need to continue emphasizing community health systems, not just as a means of improving access, but also quality. Um, we need to think about how we can engage better with community members, community health workers, um, and those who are really interested uh, directly in the outcomes of these research in a way that uh, we are distant from. So how do we do participatory economic evaluations? Uh, and lastly, we need to continue pushing for further accountability, and this is a, a role that Sheik has, has taken on uh, in some sense, um, to help aligning funding from global entities.
communities with those grassroots community principles. So thank you all for joining today. And I want to pass over to Dr. Conte. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. So uh, my name is Dr. Conte. I'm an uh, associate scientist at Johns Hopkins. And today I will present a work we did uh, Uh, we are sorry about that, but let's give it one more minute. Maybe doctor will come back soon. And if that doesn't happen, maybe we'll have the next speaker. So just give it maybe a few seconds. Yes, Dr. Kante, can you hear me? All right, so I think maybe we can have the next speaker. Sorry, uh, that was a small problem. I Can you go back to my presentation, if possible? Okay, doctor, you can go on. You're most welcome back. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I, I have some issue probably with internet. Sure, go to the next slide, thank you. Yes, so this is the Connect project. So why we, we run the project, the, the, the Connect project, we did like a an, an review of papers and found that despite this increase of health spending uh, over the years in the country of Tanzania, we know that many of those Tanzanian, especially those living in rural area, still have limit, limited access to quality and affordable health care. And uh, also we, we saw their maternal and child uh, mortality was really high and still unacceptable uh, in, in many African countries. And even so, there is still a double burden of diseases when community and not com where communicable and non communicable diseases are still uh, in increasing over the years. And also there is a shortage of uh, trained health workers that can contribute, that contribute also to a weak health system we saw there. And also, outreach of services to communities is still limited and also major challenges remain also with referral uh, uh, and acute uh, systems. So with all that, we, uh, the, the Tanzania government have what they called a national policy that was called MAM. So I'm not gonna go into the detail, but this is just a Swahili name that was there really to uh, 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 stress on the primary healthcare deployment plan, and that really tried to revitalize the community health workers uh, in, in the country. So the connect is coming from there, how we link the communities to the health system. That's why we have this connection was missing and we try to have this project and call the connect. Next slide. Overall, the aim of the connect in, not the connect, but this particular paper was really to assess the child mortality impact of posting friend and paid community health workers. As we, we, we said in the introduction, those are really, we try to have a professional community health workers to provide community care. And we wanted to see that impact on child survival in those three districts. So you can see in the next here, type of services that the community health workers were able to, to provide, start, starting from adolescent and childhood to care to the old to infancy and, 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 and childhood, from pregnancies to and newborn care. Next slide. So today, uh, we want to describe a little bit what is CONNECT. CONNECT is a randomized cluster trial. It was one of the biggest in, in, in Africa at that time uh, that we run the project. And almost one, only the only randomized cluster trial of community health workers that was done uh, uh, around that period that we run between 2011 and 2015 in three rural districts of Tanzania. So, and the particle of CONNECT was we use what we call health and demographic surveillance system 
that were implemented by the Ifakara Health Institute that uh, included like 101 villages and we really randomized one to one. Uh, uh, it was not a mass randomized cluster trial because when we did the, the selection, we know it, each community that was getting the program and the community that was not getting the program. And with this sample size, we know that we can detect 16% uh, addiction at the end of the project in under five mortality. That was our primary outcome. But this project has several secondary outcomes related to neonatal and infant mortality, but also several out secondary outcomes related to maternal and child health uh, that I'm not going to discuss here. And also we tracked single months availability of essential medicine that we provided to each community health worker and how they use it and also salary, whether it is paid in time or not. So all those were used in this paper. Next slide. Yeah, something I want to just emphasize here, uh, Connect use also what we call a pragmatic design. So, but for the first two years of the implementation, we have been providing uh, our study team was going to each community and provide them all the, uh, the needs for medicine and other uh, uh, drugs they need and, and support do, doing supervision. But in year two, when we start seeing that improvement in child survival, we, uh, the, the, the funder decided to move all that part of the project to the district level starting in year two of the project. So that's why uh, the, the result I'm going to present here will be disaggregated later by fully implementation where we have been there to provide all the support and later implementation. So overall, when you look at this graph, it tells you that before the, uh, the project was started, what I called here PRE, when you have the red, the mortality rate in the two area uh, control and intervention was almost similar. There was, uh, which means the randomization was really good. And after four years of the program, there is just slightly decline in the mortality in the uh, intervention program. That mortality was declined by 10 percent from 81 to 73. Uh, 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 per 1,000 live births, while in the comparison area, it was only 6% 6, 6 decline. And this, this mortal decline was not significant. Next slide, please. So right now, I'm going now to go into the deep analysis where we see early phase implementation for the first two years, where we have been there to provide all the services, and when we move the project to the district level. That's why you have these two phases. When you look overall, you can see there was not a, a big impact on under five mortality. But when you look in the early phase here, you can see that the mortality, the, the other ratio here was really reduced in program where we have the neonatal mortality here has been really declining, almost 15% difference between the comparison and the intervention area. And in the later phase, we haven't seen any decline that was seen in the early phase for neonatal mortality. And there is also a null effect in the program for neonatal mortality here. First row, the, the mortality has not really been improved in the comparison and the intervention area. Next slide. The, the slide is giving you now when we text vaccine that was provided to the health workers. And now we subdivide our program uh, our co intervention area in two uh, 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 sample. The sample that have medicine and we track the months by month, that's why we call it this conditional effect and have each month whether they have medicine or not and really see whether that have an effect in the mortality uh, between the two areas. When you provide them with medicine, still you can see that the post neonatal mortality was still significant and can reduce mortality. But the dangerous here is when you post those community workers without giving them essential medicine, you can see here in the late period, the last half year that says really having a community worker there without essential medicine can be dangerous for the community. That's why the, uh, the mortality was higher when in those community where we have community health workers without essential medicine. Go to the last slide. So overall, the our message here was competency-based training and deployment of com paid community health workers can improve child survival after one one month of age till five years. However, 
those community health workers should be treated as a professional and give them all essential medicine and salaries in time to have this impact. And there was no effect of the program for neonatal survival, which means probably the system need to be improved for referrals to health for facilities to take care of those uh, newborn. So uh, uh, here I will stop and, uh, and want to introduce uh, my next uh, colleague, Afra, who will speak on the third paper. Thank you, Dr. Kanti, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Afra Nwasema. I work with Living Goods as a monitoring evaluation and learning manager uh, based uh, in Kampala, Uganda. As you heard from Madeleine, uh, Living Goods is a member of CHIC, and we work with African governments to strengthen community health by advocating for compensated, uh, uh, trained, equipped, and supervised community health workers. Today, on behalf of the authors from the CHIC members, I'm presenting to you the work uh, we conducted in 2021, where we are aiming at establishing whether uh, adequately supported community health workers uh, would ensure continuity in the community-based health care provision amid this pandemics uh, like the COVID-19 that we had. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we all know that pandemics often cause declines in the service utilization, and this can ultimately kill more people, uh, even more than the outbreak itself. So the, the presence of supported and professional community health workers would then potentially blunt the impact of the pandemics uh, to the healthcare system. Uh, by professional CHWs, uh, like Aria mentioned, here we are referring to those that are paid, a salary, skilled, equipped, and supervised in line with the WHO guidelines. And in the sites where we conducted uh, uh, this work, the CHWs were supported as per these guidelines. And in addition, they had uh, received COVID-19 adapted protocols to ensure that they would uh, continue providing you know, services. They were trained and given personal protective equip equipment uh, within 45 days following the first case uh, in each country. Um, next slide. Uh, so I think here we, we, we just to emphasize that uh, even when there is adequate support uh, for, for, the, for those programs, uh, for the sites that we assessed. Uh, it can be uneven across countries, uh, but for this study, we really tried and ensured that uh, really there were professional community health workers, uh, and we assessed whether they maintained the essential community health services. Uh, and in the next slide, I'm going to be presenting to you some of the insights that came through that. So overall, we assessed 27 sites across the four countries of Kenya, Uganda, Mali, and Marawi in the Sub-Saharan Africa. Data were collected from five districts in Western and Central Kenya, uh, one district in uh, Southern Kenya. We had 19 districts from Central and Eastern Uganda. We also had one district in the capital region of Mali, and then one district in Malawi. And this overall served a population of over 5.2 million. And these were you know, being supported by over 7,500 community health workers. Uh, you realize that we were only able to consider six performance areas. Uh, and those included delivery coverage. We looked at under five child assessments. We looked at home visits. Uh, a speed of pregnancy registration. We looked at the postnatal care, how timely was it? And most uh, importantly, we also looked at the integrated community case management. Uh, so across these sites, you'll see that COVID pandemic started between uh, March and April 2020. And the modeling, or what we are calling the interruption, uh, uh, really centered around that period. So next slide. In the next slide, uh, we, we model the disruption. 
So overall, if you look at that table, uh, it doesn't seem to be very clear for all of you, uh, but the, the main finding here is that the, uh, there, was no in, there was no immediate substantial negative effect of the pandemic that was identified across uh, all the matrices that we assessed. Uh, in terms of the, of the long term, what we're calling the growth rate, we observed that on a one metric ICCM speed, uh, and you can see for it, it has a probability value less 0 0.05. It experienced a reduction following the pandemic. Uh, it means that the percentage of children under five uh, assessed with a symptom of malaria, diarrhea, or pneumonia within 24 hours of symptom onset decreased faster during the pandemic than before the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, but I think overall, we, we found no disruptions to the coverage of household visits or under five assessments, uh, as well as the speed of uh, pregnancy registration and postnatal post care. As you observe, this data came from uh, different regions uh, of Africa. So given some variability across the regions, we added a regional term in the model to allow us account for the variations. And we conducted sensitivity analysis and the results remained stable. And this potentially says that the findings that we had uh, are robust and valid. Uh, in the next slide, okay, so on this slide here, and I know now some of you might be wondering uh, how are we sure that it was the CHW, the community health workers, could then something else about the 27 sites uh, from the four you know, countries being the reason the service was maintained. I think what makes the findings more extraordinary is that there, there were a number of reasons that we should have seen uh, that the pandemic could have impacted on the service delivery, you know, factors that have historically uh, affected uh, or disrupted the, 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 the services in those countries. But to start us off, if, if you clearly see on the slide, you see that the four countries actually, all of them had three massive waves of COVID-19 during the study period. Uh, uh, and then each of these countries, you know, uh, depending on you know where you come from, there are several mobility restrictions that were put in place. And this often means that people cannot get care as they are doing that. But there was also fear of COVID-19 among the citizens and also instances of discrimination against the health uh, workers were documented in each of these four countries, even prior to the first wave. So, and, and you know, this can also predict the service disruption. So in the next slide, uh, in line to the, you know, uh, insights we've seen overall, really what we observed a stable trend for both speed and coverage performance matrices uh, over the pre and post COVID period. Of, of course, in the absence of a control, we cannot with 100% certainty attribute uh, the sustained health services you know, for over 12 months uh, amid this COVID 19 to just the professional CHWs. Uh, and you know, unfortunately, they remain rare. So, what this paper presents to us uh, is that. Uh, in the places where they existed, service was maintained, there was no disruption. And I think that, that that's what is really in, in, interesting uh, for us to learn from this paper. So as we conclude, next slide. Uh, you know, given that, you know, majority of the community health workers globally uh, remain unpaid and largely unsupported, this paper suggests that uh, the opportunity cost of not professionalizing the community health workers may be larger uh, than previously estimated, particularly in light of the possible future pandemics. And we know that Chick, uh, the, the coalition continues to advocate for professional CHWs uh, that are paid, are skilled, uh, and, and, and supervised so that then this opportunity is, is leveraged on. So uh, really the, is, this was what we're able to, uh, you, you know, evidence we're able to generate from this paper. And I want to, at this point, introduce to Joseph Adoyo. Yeah, hello everyone. 
My name is Joseph Adoyo, a public health system strengthening specialist working as deputy county medical laboratory coordinator in the Department of Health, Homa Bay County, Kenya. I have vast experience in medical laboratory technical support and coordination. I'm also trained on infodemic management in the context of COVID-19 by WHO. I am an impact fellow. Impact is improving public health management for action. In my current role, uh, where I'm working in Homa Bay County, providing leadership and management work, I equally collaboratively work with the community health system in capacity building, planning, and policy implementation. In this capacity, I work with many community health workers. The first time I encountered community health workers was during a field placement I did in Northeastern Kenya. I collaborated with the community health workers while conducting a community health needs assessment on Kalaza. And uh, of interest is the community health workers I met had a wealth of knowledge on community needs and assets and the unique ability of the community health workers to link researchers with the community. In fact, I can say this is the genesis of my experience with the community health passion in me. I also worked with the community health workers uh, while I was doing a program testing for HIV at household level in Dewa. Here, the community health workers were able uh, to support the system in providing community entry, providing logistical support, and even also doing information for door-to-door -door testing. So uh, the recent one which I did was when, uh, uh, during the COVID-19 response in Rangwe sub-county, that is in Homa Bay, I worked with community health workers to offer capacity building training and also providing the community health workers uh, with personal protective equipment that the uh, implementing partners supported us with so that uh, the community health workers were informed, they were protected, and uh, while they are offering their services in the community at the household level. So here, we also learned that the vital role community health workers play in addressing health misinformation. There is already a lot of evidence that community health workers can effectively implement and support many health interventions. Community health workers are key to community health. Decisions made about community health workers and community health should be evidence-based. The research roundup uh, from the CHIC provides a readily available and easily accessed source of evidence with which to make decision. And uh, for me personally, I love research. And uh, the key thing with the research roundup is that you find that they synthesize the key messages and takeaways so you can easily get uh, the most important information you, you, you are looking for. This helps me as a policy implementer working in this uh, uh, county government, as it gives me the evidence I need to do my role well. For example, in the area of remuneration, the government that I work for currently now has committed to give stipend to community health workers. And I feel, and I think this is a big step forward. This is because of the evidence of the input of community health workers' efforts on health system. It is time that all community health workers' decisions are made backed by evidence and with community health workers at the center of decision making. Thank you. And uh, I take this opportunity now to introduce uh, John Wabwire Shikuku, a community health worker from Kenya. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, hello everyone. 
I'm John Wabuire Shukun, from Mental Health Volunteer from Busia County, working at Port Victoria Subcall Hospital. I'm working as a community worker for the last 10 years, and around 11 now, 11 years. Okay, as a community health worker, I have made responsibility that I do. I'm the first conduct for health service in the community. I get the community on how to improve health and prevent illness by adopting health practices, including promoting compliance with the treatment of advice given. I visit homes to determine the health situation and initiate dialogue with the household members to undertake the necessary action for improvement. Sometimes this involves securing appropriate home care for the sick from health facilities. I also do treat common ailments and minor injuries with the first aid under the support and the guidance of the community health education worker. I also stock with the CHV kit with the supplies provided through the volume file from the, the university from the users, okay, the community members who use this. I refer cases to the nearest health facility, that's for the Tosa County. I run community health dialogues and action days, and this no day is the same, and the work I do is very that busy. During the pandemic, we saw even more the value of mental health workers. We often represent a trusted voice in the community, and that's also represent valuable basis for social mobilization and the distribution of health information during outbreaks. Community health workers like myself act as a community level educators, organizers, mobilizers, and making sure our communities respond to the pandemic appropriately. And we also contribute to the contribution to syndrome disease surveillance to the system while completing routine activities and field services gaps in the health system. It was around November 2019, I started getting involved with the uh, Community Health Impact Coalition after I realized, so in their website, uh, they had a mission I would have to be part of. This is because community health workers haven't had a voice in the issue affecting their own welfare. Far too long have been neglected. Despite the fact that we do a lot to serve lives, I wanted a platform where I could openly communicate and learn. Through my training in the community advocacy that's going on, and my everyday desire to help other professional community workers, I have learned a lot and developed significantly. Since becoming involved with in the community health impact coalition as a community health worker advocate, I have also been involved in research where I co authored a paper on community health volunteers during the pandemic. My contribution in this paper was to provide a community health worker perspective as to why it is crucial for country to have a strong and accessible national health system, especially at the community level, and why this is vital for the pandemic preparedness and response. The development of this paper was preceded by, by extensive discussion by partners, stakeholders, and staff from the different departments in the Ministry of Public Health and Sanitation. With this, I also thank my fellow community health workers who shared their experience the, the, that informed the development of this paper. It was a really, really uh, an experience to me. As a community health worker, we have been a major league player in the implementation of prayer market since the 1980s and still continue to play a critical role in mobilizing community, taking, taking care of their health and providing best health care at the community level. The research also shows this to be true. And it also shows that we need to do our work. To be more effective and efficient, there's need for appropriate salaries, provisions, supplies, and skills. On skills, such training needs to be well planned and implemented using standard and training manual that, that, that can take into account the level of operation and the capacity of workers. This also requires the support of well-trained, informed trainers and supervisors from formal healthcare system. With that, I thank you all for listening to my experience and I call upon you to sign up the research roundup and use it to make an informed decision with the community volunteers and workers. Thank you very much. And God bless you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, John. And thank you to all the sharp and generous speakers we had today. But just to emphasize everything that has been said, I believe that we've heard and really have tried to understand everything that the speakers have spoken to us. And to add to that, we have millions of CHWs like John who are not paid, 
supported or supplied, just like we've heard from the research that has been done. It is a dual sided human rights issue. CHWs are exploited and less effective for patients. And we fall within that category because we are community members. So despite decades of global health investment, one billion people will never see a health worker. As we have discussed today, Sheik is making professional CHWs the norm worldwide by changing guidelines, funding, and policy. Research is a vital tool to achieve this mission. We use research to dismantle modest claims of casualty, to expand ideas of what is possible in community health, to overcome institutional obstacles. And the research roundup is key to our goal of increasing evidence use within the field, just like we've heard from the speakers, the researchers, and the experience in the community. Today, you've heard about three of the 10 papers that coalition members selected as highlights for, from across 100 issues. Make sure you sign up to the chic mailing list at chwimpact.org. I repeat that, chwimpact.org to receive the milestone issue next week and learn about the other seven papers because today we only presented three. CHWs are essential component of a first class health system worldwide. And we are in the world, so we are beneficiaries of that system. They show up for their communities every single day by publishing, engaging with, and being informed by the research, we can all make sure that we show up for them as well. I think it's, it's fair. A future where our professional CHWs who are salaried, skilled, supervised, and supplied is possible. But it will take all of us. And I emphasize that we are part of the system because we benefit from the CHW services. So I thank you all for joining us today and enjoy your time wherever you may be. Thank you.